You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 106. The Dental Guys Book Club, Zero Bone Loss Concepts by Tomas Linkovicius. As we continue our Dental Guys Book Club, we dive into the next chapters of Zero Bone Loss Concepts where we'll learn the actual surgical techniques to increase soft tissue thickness around implants. How important is this? Well, it could be the key to keeping the bone around your implants for a lifetime. So you don't wanna miss this one this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, uh, first of all, Merry Christmas to everyone. Um, yeah. It's uh, Christmas week, and you guys have, uh, if you're tuning this podcast, thank you uh, for tu- tuning in. Mm-hmm. This happens to be Christmas Eve. When yeah, we hope, you're, this, hope you're ready. Hope you're ready for Christmas and having a good break and finally getting to relax Rest. a little bit. <laughs> Man, it's yeah. been a crazy, crazy Christmas yeah. season. John, we just got back from uh, a little travel, a little CE, our last CE of the year. We talked about traveling down and um, going to um, see Pat Allen, mm. and um, we can talk a little bit more about the course, but most of the time when we travel, um, you know, we, we we plan on running and exercising. In Scottsdale, I ran quite a bit with you. This time, I didn't run. My wife was with me, and she decided to work out on her own anyway. I just didn't work out at all for some reason. But yep. really why I didn't work out is because you and I traveled with one of our good buddies. And he has been training, and you have too. Him, He's been training for super long distance runs. Right. And yeah. uh, like full marathons. Yeah, he just finished his first marathon like uh, yeah. three three or four weeks before this trip. And right. I've been So doing- I overhear yeah. I've been, been doing half doing, marathons, but not not I'm not up to the marathon league. Right, and but you, I've been watching you. You've been you've been kind of maintaining a pretty decent mile, weekly mileage. Yeah, yeah. And I overheard, hey, uh, I'm going to get up in the morning and run eleven, twelve. I heard that or twelve, twelve. And I'm like, yeah, yeah let's just get up and run a half marathon tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, that's. What and then we're going to go take Pat Allen's course <laughs> the next day. I'm like, you guys. Like yep. simmer down. All right. But so So I decided I was gonna do it. <laughs> tell me tell me tell me exactly how this all well really I mean Well, so so yeah, so our good friend Jonathan, also another John, um <laughs> I've known him a long time and, and we've we've kind of followed each other on Strava, you know. So if you guys who do any running or biking, you know about Strava, it's the way you can kind of keep up with how you're doing, how your friends are doing. You encourage, you kind of basically encourage people uh, to keep up their hard work with running. And if you're training for something, you can kind of keep track of your training. And uh, so I've been on Strava for a long time. Uh, basically, just it's a way for me to keep track of my runs. So I kind of knew where he was at. He kind of knew where I was at. We're about the same pace. Okay, so that's why this whole thing worked. He's like, yeah, I got to run a long run tomorrow. And I was like, well, so do I this weekend, so let's do it. So we're in Dallas, downtown, staying at the Weston Galleria, right at the big mall downtown, which was crazy big mall. Anyway, now everywhere I've gone in big cities, now this is going to say, if, you, if you're from Dallas. <laughs> it's going to sound bad. I, I don't know what to tell you guys. Now, maybe we were just in the wrong part of town, but my very uh you know naive take on Dallas it is it is that it is the least friendly it's the least running friendly city that I've stayed in big city wise on a downtown now again maybe we're just in the wrong place so correct me if I'm wrong here but where we were the first morning the first day of the course we went out we ran I think four miles and we had this route we thought oh this surely will be a good route it'll have some sidewalks some uh street lights 
And oh my goodness, we had such a hard time that first day, just on this short four mile run, just finding a place that like we wouldn't die from oncoming traffic running us over. So the next day we, we had a 12 mile run coming. And so uh, we got up really early, of course, really early, because we had to make it to the course. The, 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 the bus left for the course at like 7.45. So we had to get up really early. So we, we picked a different route that looked maybe more promising. Well, turns out that route was equally horrible. And there were like almost no street lights. We're running in almost pitch black conditions on horrible sidewalks or no sidewalks. And we kept making all these turns trying to find, so anyway, long story short, running along, we're six miles in. So basically halfway into this run and I'm running along in almost pitch black and like an idiot, I <laughs> caught my foot on like this crazy jagged sidewalk oh, and man. I go down and I mean, I went down hard, like hard, hard and so fortunately, like I hit my right knee and I hit my right shoulder kind of first. So I didn't get super road rash. But as I came down the end, <laughs> I got my, my face, like my nose, like the bridge of my nose the and the, of side, nose, of, the side of my nose. Pretty good little. I mean, it doesn't take much to skin that up, you know, because so I got but my hands out. I did get my hands out, but my knee took most of it. And my face, kind of the last six inches, I feel like I skidded to a stop. So I get up. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And he gets so his phone out. And he so shines his like light flashlight on my face. And he's like, oh, man, that looks pretty bad. And, of course, he takes a picture, which hopefully that picture will never surface. So <laughs> takes, that, Yeah, I'm sure that's going to show up in the show notes. <laughs> so the picture he takes a picture. And then he's like, dude, that looks pretty bad. So I'm like, I'm fine because I really was. I wasn't hurting. You know, maybe it was adrenaline, maybe whatever, but I, right. I didn't feel like I'd injured myself as much as I just skinned myself up a little bit. So we get up and we literally ran back. Well, yeah, I finished did. The, you finished it, man. We finished it out. We finished the 12. But what I didn't realize, because it was so dark, I didn't even see that I was bleeding. Now, I could kind of tell, like I could kind of tell I was bleeding a little bit down on my knee, but I didn't really know how bad it was. My nose is a little bloody, but I didn't really, I don't know. You can't tell when you're, when you're, when it's dark. So I get to the hotel. <laughs> And I walk in the front door, didn't know, like, didn't know how bad I looked. I was bloody, man. Like my knee had bled down to my socks. Like that's how bad it was. Like I had blood in my socks and I walked in the front door and these ladies, these nice Texas fine ladies are like, oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, I'm fine. I think they thought I'd either been in a murder or like murdered someone else. So I, but the thing was, we got back so late because of all this trying to find our way that it was, I only had about 25 minutes to get ready for the bus to take us to the course. Yeah, because I, I texted you and you were like, hey man, I fell. Yeah. And you sent me a picture of me because I was getting coffee for everybody. Yep. And I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you fell? So then I go to my hotel room, I take a shower, and then I see how bad it is. I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh Oh Lord, this is really, I look horrible. And of course I had already been on day one. So everybody in the course had seen me like looking normal and here about to go to day two. So there's no way I can live this down. I already know that. So Man. I called the hotel desk. I'm like, you guys got any band-aids? They brought some band-aids up. They were, the security guy brought them up, which is hilarious. I think they thought maybe I was like a security risk because the security br guy right. brought up these band-aids and he's kind of checking me out. So gave me these big band-aids. Well, because I was like sweaty and I was still like, I mean, I'd taken a shower, but I was bloody. The band-aids basically fell off my leg about 20 minutes into the course and my mm. knee is bleeding. So I end up bleeding through my pants on my knee, which talk about like making a good professional impression. Here I am, bloody face, looks like I got in a bar fight. So then I have to come back to, to work the next. How do you think that went down? <laughs> you walk in the room, every patient thinks every patient, man. that you've been in a domestic situation. Probably <laughs> is what I'm thinking. They're right. like, your wife left you and she punched you on the way out or you got in a fight with some guy or whatever. So I have to come in and like every time I'm like wanting to tell like a really good story. But what are you going to say? Like Texas bar fight, you mm -hmm. know? 
So I'm like, I wish I had a better story, but what I did is I, I couldn't walk, right? I couldn't run, so I fell. It's this so is a weak. classic John story. Yeah, so you know? finally I'm healed up. If you're looking at the YouTube video, you may notice a little little, little yeah, something little over here. It's there, finally but, better. But honestly, uh, you kind of got lucky. I mean... I could have been a lot worse. It could have been a lot worse. We could have been talking... We could have been nose. talking big injury, or I could have evolved a tooth or something awesome. Oh, man. Yeah, we would have been going to Pat Allen's office and saying, let's put some implants in. Yeah, I would have been in good shape, at least. I guess I would have had lots of good right. people to help yeah, me. At least uh, we could have got a good graft. But, oh, right. my goodness, so stupid. You feel like an idiot sometimes, you know? Well, I'll tell you what. Just kind of to think about this this uh, next segment here in this zero bone loss thing and talking about, like, we're, we're going to talk about the course Yep. A little bit it's gonna later tie on in. in the show. It's going to tie, tie in. So stay tuned. We're going to give you a little review on the course um, later on in the podcast. Uh, so stay tuned. A little teaser there. A little yep. teaser. It's, it's Christmas time. It's Christmas time, guys. We're super excited about Christmas. Hope you have a Merry Christmas. And we're looking forward to this show uh, as we continue our coverage of uh, t- zero bone loss concepts. And... Um, and uh, really, I tell you what, John. There's a lot of things coming up in the new year, yep. and if and if you're again have a great new year, spend a lot of time with your family and friends, and remember what uh, you know what it's all about. And listen, uh, we really want to thank everybody for tuning in for 2020. I think it's been yes. uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, but most of all, thank you so much for 2019. We're excited about what's to come, but we wouldn't be where we're at if it wasn't for you guys. So thank right. you so much. Merry Christmas. And we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. As we're discussing growing the value of your practice, one of the first areas that we have to focus on is planning. Planning is simply charting a trajectory on your practice and outlining how you can achieve the trajectory of the goals. The way we approach this is through a model called strategic planning. The strategic planning model breaks the year down into four 90-day periods of time. The object of a strategic plan is to have three key objectives in your business with only one focused on a financial goal. For each objective, we must outline three tactics. A tactic is what we're going to do to accomplish the objective. And finally, for each tactic, we must have three actions. What specifically is your practice going to do to accomplish each tactic? At the beginning of each 90-day planning session, we'll have a total of 27 action items that must be accomplished within the next 90 days of your practice. Have you ever tried this? If not, check out our strategic planning course on financiallysimple.com. If you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. All right, and we're back. And, uh, this is, we thought, Wes, when we first started this process of going through this book, that it would be part one of four. And <laughs> I don't know, I think it's going to end up being part six of four or part five of four because there's so much good content. We're wanting to do it, you know, justice. Mm-hmm. How awesome was it to have uh, Tomas himself link to our stuff yeah. uh, that we're doing after the first episode? We're excited. Uh, to, to maybe get to, to uh, yeah. talk with him more over time. But we want to dive right into the next segment here of this of So this what book. we're talking about here is how to increase the thickness of soft tissue above the implant interface. The first way that we discussed this was to actually countersink the implant deeper, offsetting the <clears throat> implant, taking into account anatomy. If you have a certain amount of space above anatomy that you can actually sink the implant a little deeper. Right. Okay. To account for thinner tissues. Right. Now keep in mind, if you're going to do that, you have to have particularly a deeper conical connection. Right. More taper connection, ideally. Yeah. You got to have a more taper connection, a solid connection, something that has very little micro movement. We know there's, 
uh, we can get into that. But I think it's important to note that you have to have that. So, John, let's get into chapter six. Yeah. Uh, one of the techniques. Way. Yeah. One yeah. of the techniques that you can use uh, to improve the soft tissue thickness and therefore the bone stability uh, is flattening of the ridge hmm. uh, and or plasting of the ridge. Uh, the idea behind this is that if you know that you have a ridge that is uh, comes to a point uh, and, and there may be some thin tissue above that point or you just have a ridge that is overall thicker uh, and you can you can serve you know there, you can stand to, to, to lose a little bit of bone because you know you have plenty of bone where you need it above the anatomy rather than sinking the implant deeper, you can flatten the ridge, which therefore creates more room for soft tissue to then grow in. And this is especially useful if you're using an implant that is either a tissue level implant mm. or, uh, or an implant that has a polished collar of some type. Because as we know from our first chapters, that bone will not adhere to a polished collar. We've, we've reiterated that. So if we know that, what's the advantage of a polished collar? Well, it's cleansability potentially uh, in the event of periimplantitis, maybe easier to clean. Um, there's some nice things about polished collars, some nice things about tissue level implants. So if you have that type of implant and you want to use that and you need more soft tissue thickness, then you could put the polished collar, you could flatten the ridge and then put the polished collar right above where the bone is now and so let's say you had one, mil one millimeter of tissue, just to use an example, one millimeter, very thin tissue, and you wanted to develop your three millimeters of tissue. So you could take your implant that say has a polished collar or a tissue level implant, you could plasty the ridge two millimeters, and you could then place the polished collar just above bone level. And according to the studies we're seeing here, according to the data that uh, Linkovich is, is showing, we should have uh, regeneration of a biologic width, which should give us back our soft tissue thickness of three millimeters, uh, which allows for bone stability. Versus if you put that soft, if you don't plasty the ridge and you put that same tissue level implant just above the bone with thin tissue, you're going to potentially have bone loss around that implant in order to establish that... that uh, around uh, that, any implant. Around any implant. And you're going to have that in order to establish that biologic width. The other advantages uh, that he outlines in this chapter on... Well, wait, before you get into that, yeah, other yeah. advantages there, I think that this is a technique, like if you don't have a cone beam machine, mm. you, 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 I don't think you can do this. You don't really know... Well, you can do this. I'm mm -hmm. not saying you can't. But going into the procedure... Yeah, you don't necessarily I mean, know. You don't know. And like I tell you what, every time I do this so much, I, I didn't realize I did it until the other day. I, I I mean, you just practice, you know, you just you get in there and I'm doing a healed ridge surgery and I was like, that's a sharp point. I saw it on the CT. I said, you know, this ridge needs to be flattened, mm -hmm. right? This ridge needs to have proper form. It'll allow me to have better emergence profile. We'll talk mm -hmm. about some of the advantages mm -hmm. that John will talk about here in a minute. But the CT and the planning helps you to see what's going to, to need to happen right. during, the, during the procedure. It's not a hard procedure no. um, to, to learn. I think it does give us other things which we'll get into. But I think, you know, one of the things I think about here is like, how many of you are practicing without cone beam tomography? Because this is a technique that mm. if you had a cone beam, you're going to be able to see that peak of bone. On the, on the slice that you take through the jaw, and you're going to be able to see the width. Now, one of the things that, you, that we see a lot of people doing is what we call lateral ridge augmentation. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, if I have a thin ridge, then I'm going to augment. Most of the time, it's going to be to the buckle because that's where we lose most of our bone in a lot of our cases because that's where the muscle pulls in mm -hmm. and lays down on the bone. You lose that buckle plate. And so typically this lateral ridge aug that we're talking about would be done to the buckle. Well, what we know is that bone grafting, right, is not something that we want to have to subject to 
the patient if we don't have to. Right. Right. Because it, it is it leads to other complications. We don't want to get into that. But if I can if I can safely do this procedure that we're going we're describing here, I t- it turns out that I'm using the patient's native bone. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm going down to a wider location. Yep. You know, Dr. Mish talks about in his book that you need to have 1.5 millimeters all the way around your implant. And a lot of people, when they put implants in, they don't pay attention to that thin little peak of bone up there, and they put their implant, it's just barely encased. Right. And as Tomas says, you will lose bone in that area because the tissues are thin above those thin <clears throat> peaked areas. Right. And so... And that- and I think that that also that is just as Wes is saying. If you, so if you if you plasty the bone, if you flatten the ridge, you're getting two benefits in a case like that. You're getting thicker soft tissue, mm-hmm. and you're also automatically getting yourself down into potentially the wider area of bone. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then third, you're also, as he points out, getting into more cancellous bone, which right. potentially because we have more blood supply in the cancellous bone is more osteoconductive or at least has the potential to be more osteoconductive so or osteoinductive and so we know that there's the there's the added benefit of of basically more bleeding which we Mm -hmm. want to establish a clot which then can turn into connective tissue uh, above that implant so before doing a lateral ridge augmentation make sure you need that uh, versus simply being able to drop your implant into this uh, nice wider trough of bone by doing some some flattening, um, and I and I think the other thing Wes alluded to is how this can affect your emergence profile. Oh, if man. if you have a ridge that is scalloped or has irregularities, mm-hmm. and you are trying to reduce your embrasure size. You're trying mm-hmm. to reduce your food trapping, especially especially if it is a short implant mm-hmm. that is going to be having a long clinical crown. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that if we can contour that bone in a way that reduces that, um, that quick emergence, if we can create a more gradual emergence mm-hmm. by how we contour and shape the bone, we are going to be able to minimize the size of the embrasures, the food trapping uh, that can happen. So well, I, what ends up happening, John, it's the old school way of like ponic shaping, right? Yes. Is that you, you've you got a couple different thoughts on abutment design, and we won't want to get it too much, but have you ever seen the lollipop look, mm. you know, in these situations? And I think where he, on page 88, figure 612, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're following along with us here, you see figure A, John, it shows... The lollipop look. and But look at the clinical crown compared in this shot right here. Yep. The clinical crown in area 19, let's say that's 19, does not look as long as 18. Right. Well, if this was done properly, and actually the implant was placed properly, much like what we see in figure A and B, then what you end up having is a better contour, mm-hmm. a better contour, a better abutment contour, which allows you to do what John is talking about, close up those embrasure spaces, put some of the pressure on the tissues, the soft tissues, and maintain a more hygienic situation. Yep, um, yep, exactly. And I think that if you, you know, he, he goes on to kind of finally point out the fact, too, that when you're talking about this this uh, generation of the proper emergence, that, you know, if you do not have the proper running room, <clears throat> as we yeah. often say, and you have to go abruptly from abutment to crown, not only does that create issues with food trapping and that lollipop look, but it also produces excessive pressure on the tissue, oftentimes as you have to blanch Mm -hmm. the tissue more than you would like. But Mm -hmm. he does point out the fact that having some pressure on tissue is Mm -hmm. beneficial to maybe increasing epithelial attachment. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that, and the way that you design your implant placement, even in the type of implant that you place, you know, you might think, okay, either I'm going to flatten the ridge and use a polished collar implant, or I'm going to not flatten the ridge. I'm going to drive the implant deeper, right? And I'm going to need to use an implant that has a more stable connection, both of which, if placed at the same point, will get a nice emergence profile, but 
you have to think about how your implant design is going to be used. So if you're somebody that says, I only have one implant in my office, whatever that implant is, make sure that you think about this. And if it's a tissue level type of implant, you're going to probably be flattening ridges more versus if it's a subcrestal good Morse taper connection implant, you can probably get away with driving it deeper Right. More often. You're still going to have to profile, though. With, but you, exactly. You do that. But you're going to have to profile more with that implant. So you're still having to profile or remove bone, kind of either way. It's a question of whether you want to do that on the on the upfront, knowing that, um, or whether you want to do that on the back end. And I think that's where this opens your eyes to just the idea that we need to be looking at this, thinking about this. And as Wes said, <clears throat> if you don't have CT gosh, you're having to do this on the fly, which is mm -hmm. uh, a potential challenge. So if you have access to cone beam CT, this becomes an easy decision uh, as you're planning your cases. I also think, John, that this is where the restorative driven mind mm -hmm. has an advantage over a surgeon. Yeah. Because if you start looking at the top of the occlusal plane down to the bone on these healed ridge cases. Yep. And just simply take a perio probe and measure the length of the adjacent teeth. And you just think, okay, I've got, you know, two millimeters of tissue here. I'm going to be putting my mil my implant down at least a millimeter, or I'm going to be contouring or flattening the ridge at least a millimeter to gain that extra millimeter to get to the three that we need. Yep. Okay. Is that, and here's the question you should be asking yourself. Is that appropriate for the size of crown that I need to have restoratively? Mm. Is it going to look right? You know, Gary DeWood at Spear Education says this. If it just doesn't look like right, then it's probably not right. Yeah. And yeah. so true, right? I was looking at a case today and the teeth, I showed it to every person in my office. I was treatment planning. I said, look at this. I was like, what do you think? about that this and they were mm. like yeah the teeth teeth are short they didn't even there were people that didn't have any dental iq that said the teeth were short yep so yep. i think we get so caught up in the minutia right yep. as a surgeon we want to be the surgeon right right and then as a general dentist as a prosthodontist or as a restoring doc you want to be the restoring doc but man if you can marry the two here right wow this Whether you're a powerful. surgeon understanding that or you're a restorative dentist placing your own implants, there's super some powerful. advantages there. And I think that, that um, that's where we're trying to get both sides as we're talking about this on the podcast. It's not about trying to make everybody do both things. It's about right. trying to get both sides to understand each other uh, and, and think the same way. So, John, he mentioned some interesting things here. He says, like you said earlier, for this, this type of procedure, because you're not going super subcrestal with this you're actually placing your implants just at the crest of the ridge or just below bone you actually are using you can use regular connection implants mm -hmm. uh, that would be something that is non you know matching um or a matching connection matching connection like yeah matching connection or you can use a tissue level implant in these particular situations because um you are a polished collar implant Yep. per se, you don't have to have that deep conical connection because we're actually putting the implant flush with the table of bone. Yep. It's a great chapter. It's something to definitely remember to help us uh, increase that soft tissue thickness. And Wes, let's talk about uh, chapter Temple. seven. This is good yeah. stuff. So whenever you get to a certain situation where you can't do some of the other things, right, that we've been talking about. We've been talking about sinking your implant deeper, right? We've been talking about removing bone. And Tomas, at the beginning of Chapter 7, the tent pole technique, he says the previous two chapters we've discussed these things to increase vertical soft tissue in areas where we had at least 12 millimeters of bone height. Hmm. Now, what if... You don't have enough bone, vertical, vertical bone thickness, and you need to need to augment, or you need to get thicker soft tissue. Well, let me just tell you right now, the tent pole technique is what he describes here, and essentially, imagine 
um, let me describe this briefly for you, is that you place your implant, okay, in an area where you have tissues that are around two millimeters or less, but mm -hmm. not less than one millimeter, okay? So let's just say it's between one and two millimeters. That's what Tomas describes as the most ideal situation here. So you place your implant at the crest of the ridge. Remember, we're dealing with bone heights here that aren't... This could be a short implant situation, right? Yeah, exactly. We, we have anatomy limiting how what we can do to the bone. So we have to augment the soft tissue. So let's say that we achieve... We place our implant. Then instead of putting a cover screw, we actually put a cover screw a, that is a little taller, mm -hmm. a tent pole essentially. So essentially what you have to be trained in in this situation, Tomas describes it as releasing the soft tissue. So wait, right? let me make sure before you go into that, okay. you're saying place the implant, right? place a taller healing, healing abutment mm -hmm. into the implant and then close the tissue over that still getting primary closure. Is that, is that right? That's what I'm saying, John. Yeah. So how so you, do you so how, stretch? So what does that do for you? What is that before you go into the technique? Right. What does that do for you in terms of how does that affect your soft tissue thickness? So the question is, and as just as you see in fig, Figure Seven One on page ninety two at the top of the page, you see an illustration here where the tissue is over top of that taller healing abutment, right, or taller cover screw. So there's a space in between the thin tissue on top of the tent pole, and then there's this space in between that tissue over top of your tent pole and your bone. Mm -hmm. Now, what fills in there, John, whenever you sew that up on the top? Well, blood. you're going to have a blood clot, right? Right, and you're not going to have bone form on that in that area right? because the tissue's thin. Right. Right? So let's say you lift that tissue up two millimeters, and it was between one and two. Blood flows in there. You did a good job getting primary closure. Guess what the cells are going to stimulate to form? Yeah, I would think it would be connective tissue in there. Connective tissue. Which You're going to have a want. dense fibrous connective tissue develop. In fact, Tomas goes through the actual procedure, but he also has done research to show that this works. It is a validated method for increasing soft tissue thickness. Now, let me just say right now, unless you are skilled at flap design and releasing tissue from bone, this may not be the te technique for you. Because, and unless you're really good at getting primary closure, when primary closure is difficult this may not be the technique for you, mm. okay? Um, I think that it is a feasible technique for a, for a seasoned surgeon, but I also think that it can be a very difficult thing to achieve if you don't have um, a significant amount of surgical experience or just you're gifted at surgery. Because you got to really mobilize these flaps, right? If you're That's talking right. about putting a taller healing abutment on here now, You've got to advance your flap maybe another couple millimeters coronally yeah, we over can't, this. And we're not talking about stretching it, John. If mm. you stretch it and you put tension on your sutures, mm -hmm. you're in trouble mm -hmm. because you will not get soft tissue in a stretch situation to adhere. It needs to be tensionless, and that requires more releasing than you can imagine in some of these situations. Mm -hmm. It's actually harder to do this. When I've done this, it's actually harder to do this in single tooth sites because you're working in such tight, confound spaces. You actually have to dissect around teeth. You're always looking from where you can grab this. Um, it's easier to do this when you have more room, per se. If you're new yep. at it, don't start with a single tooth. You know, you need to start with something where you're maybe working in a larger site where you have a larger edentulous area, mm. like a free-ended 
a free ended site or something like that. Yeah, but it yeah. is something that works. I've seen this work. One of the periodontists that I used to work with, he's passed away now. You may have heard me talk about him on the show. He was the one that introduced me to this t- technique. Right. And uh, we started using it um, in the anterior to increase soft tissue thickness. So yep. it's not it's not new. It's right. just applying some. Well, and it's been used in. I think about what we've seen this um, in in our. Uh, a totally different approach is with cancer surgery. You know, mm-hmm. we see That's sometimes right. when you have these big resections and they're trying to graft bone into the mandible, sometimes they'll drive giant tent pole type of screws up through the mandible to try to also graft bone. So it's a, it's a technique that I've seen before used in these big, you know, crazy reconstructive situations, but to see it in this situation, makes really good sense. And I think this is a technique you can learn if, mm-hmm. as you said, Wes, you've had some surgical experience. Uh, he talks about using two different types of sutures. He talks about using deep mattress sutures uh, and also superficial sutures to really be able to make sure that this flap is in the right position and is tension-free. He talks about different ways to make the incision, either at the mucogingival junction to get a lot of advancement or um, just to be able to to do a lot of release. Um, so this is not easy. If anybody's seen um, high-level vertical ridge augmentation done by somebody like Istvan Urban, uh, you see all of the uh, release that's necessary to get a tension-free closure. It is no joke. This is not as advanced as that, but certainly requires care because if this comes apart, uh, you're, you're back to square one and you've probably ended up losing more uh, than you started done. with. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of the things, too, I think it's important because he brings it up several times. I mentioned it earlier. This is a technique not for anything in thin tissue type, right? This is this, You need to be using this whenever your tissues are greater than one, less mm-hmm. than two. Mm-hmm. It's a great technique. And keep in mind, these are techniques. You would say, well, why not just sink it deeper? Well, we're dealing with situations here where you can't sink your implant deeper. Right. Right. Some people aren't comfortable with short implants. I'm just going to say it. Yeah. Right? John and I are. But some people just aren't, you know, comfortable with five and a half millimeter implants, mm-hmm. you know, um, and that's okay, right? You know, you don't have to commit to that. But even five and a half, sometime, you're gonna have to use techniques like this because you're dealing with people that have debilitated jaws, right? And and I think it's even more important when you're in these areas of limited anatomy, right? Mm-hmm. That you understand before you dive in and take that surgery on. You need to understand how to manage not just the bone, but manage the soft tissue, manage the, manage everything. Like I, I posted a picture of the day about understanding comprehensive dentistry requires a deeper understanding of materials and methods. Mm-hmm. And I think that a greater understanding of surgery and especially in areas of, of compromised anatomy requires a deeper understanding of great, more advanced surgical techniques from start to finish because you really don't know sometimes until you get in there. Yep. You know what you're going to run into, John. This is a great technique. It's one of the things that I think that I might, because of this book, employ a little bit more, mm-hmm. especially in light of what we just what we just took at um, in Dallas, John. Yeah. Right. Right. Because this next chapter. Yeah is exactly why we took Pat Allen's course. Yep. Vertical yep. soft tissue augmentation, chapter eight. Yeah, and, is and this why. is really, you know, when we go back to what got us interested in Linkovicious work, um, mm-hmm. if you search back and you look at all of his publications going way back, he started building a case for this soft tissue thickness uh, idea. And he started it off as you, if you've, you know, listened to other episodes, you know, he started off by looking at, uh, how it seemed to, what, what, what difference did it make with soft versus or or with thin versus thick? Then he compared it platform shifting versus non-platform shifting and showed that it seemed like the tissue mattered more than the design of the implant. Uh, and, and then we worked our way up through some of the other studies you mentioned. and, And really, I feel like one of the final, kind of proof of concept ideas was, all right, so if this is all true, what would happen if we augmented the soft tissue? 
and we then saw what did soft tissue augmentation do to bone loss. So imagine the if if we if we're going to accept like a vicious whole idea of say a one millimeter thick tissue means you're going to lose two millimeters, right? We if that's if we're going to accept that, then we should it should stand to reason that if we put in some soft tissue to that site that's one millimeter and we augment that site up to three, we should lose close to zero. So he tested that. He studied that. And and I remember when this study came out, Wes, we oh, talked about like it. 20... Uh, it was 11, 12, maybe 13. Yeah, yeah. And and we talked about it and we were bl- kind of blown away by how good it, it, it was and but how... But really why we were blown away, John, is we started questioning whether connection mattered. That was it because we we really were everybody was wanting to know and we talked about this early on because we were we were hung you and I were hung up on like man mammy implant design really does matter yes. and like we were kind of having this internal struggle especially me because I chose an implant at the time I was like I need a better connection yeah because I want less screw loosening and I'm right. seeing less bone loss right yeah and you were thinking and most people were thinking and most and people you were still throwing are it thinking. right back at me you were like dude I don't think connection matters so yeah. much as I think like just you know you and, need to get and the I implant. think that's because I had been working more with implants that weren't as good of a connection I saw like okay I was seeing pretty good results but right maybe then some... I started like sending you pictures remember that yeah remember oh back yeah, in the day oh, yeah. When we first met, so I was so like, we didn't really out. know though we didn't really yeah. know we were just we were kind of guessing based on on our experience. So this study comes out, um, the, and basically when you look and, and you know, the, if you just read through this chapter, it's, it's so, so good because we, we looked, he looked at not only, um, different types of implants, he looked at platform shifting, he versus non, and then he looked at different ways to augment the tissue with different materials. He also looked at whether you would do it as a single stage versus a two stage procedure, whether you would get primary closure uh, over it with, and he's primarily using alloderm, although he does talk about mucograft as well in this chapter. But alloderm is kind of the classic, uh, you know, allogeneic graft here. And so, kind of step one that he looked at was okay, if we take this thin tissue situation and we put the implant right at the crest. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you take a one millimeter thin tissue and you put the implant right at the crest. Now, what would happen if you just close that up? You should, in theory, lose two millimeters or up to two millimeters of bone. So the test was, the study was, let's place a nice, thick, doubled over layer of alloderm Mm -hmm. into that area and let's obtain primary closure over this implant and then let's come back and let's measure how much bone we ended up with and how much bone loss, how much tissue thickness we had. And he found that there was this incredible reduction in crustal bone loss for about 1.5 millimeters less uh, crustal bone loss and found that the tissue thickness was uh, uh, 2.21 millimeters after augmentation with the graft, which, or I'm sorry, the mean increase, I should say, of soft tissue thickness, 2.2 millimeters. So we were seeing what we would expect. The soft tissue increased by 2.2, the bone loss decreased by 1.5. Now that's not right two and two, but it's close enough to tell us something. And so then we re- he repeated this with a non-submerged approach. So let's just take alloderm and let's cut a hole in it and let's put a healing abutment, pop it through that hole, and let's, again, obtain the best closure we can. But this isn't primary closure. This is perforated through by a healing abutment. Oh, man. is right, that? Gonna... we know with allodermous materials that infection is common. Right. It's, you know, whenever you, don't, you leave it exposed. Yeah, you don't want to leave it exposed, but... In this situation, you're potentially leaving it exposed. Not and much, but I no, mean, not a much, little bit. Not much. And he was using, I think, Puros Dermis in this case and mm-hmm. found that there was a significant decrease in bone loss, a significant increase in soft tissue thickness. Um, so when you looked at thin tissue on that study, the group A with thin tissue means the bone loss was about 1, 1.2. When you did thin and you augmented it, it went down by one millimeter. And when you're in thick tissue, guess what? The thick tissue 
was the same amount of bone loss as the thin tissue that was augmented. So this is such a well-designed study because it's split mouth types of studies, it's mm -hmm. side by side implant studies, and it's showing that there's equivalency of augmenting thin tissue, whether you do it in a submerged situation or whether you do it in a non-submerged, you know, essentially a single stage situation, you are seeing the same amount of bone loss in thick tissue that you were seeing in the augmented thin tissue. And he showed this then with xenograft. He talks about uh, a, a little less common materials, the xenografts, but still showed good results. And this really to us, I remember talking with you about this, Wes, and it was like, well, there you go. If if this theory, if this theory and this these studies were were true about how soft tissue thickness made a difference, this had to work. Because if it didn't work, we'd be really scratching our heads thinking maybe we missed something. But now you add, if you can add this in, whether you're a surgeon who's doing this or whether you're a restorative dentist who is seeing issues with bone loss around your surgeon's implants and these thin tissue sites, I know if you've been listening to this show, I know you've been going back to some of these cases that have lost bone in your practice. And I, I know you've been going back and you've been looking at bite wings, or if yep. you haven't, you should be. You should be looking at pre-implant placement bite wings and look at the outline of the soft tissue and measure it. And then look at the implant placement. Where was it placed on day one? Was it at the crest? Probably. Was the tissue thin? Might have been. Look at the bone loss one to two years later, and it will start to blow your mind. So if you're the restorative dentist and you're seeing this problem, Start talking to your surgeon. Hey, maybe we should be doing some simultaneous augmentation with Alloderm. Or if you're the surgeon, you should be looking at this in these thin tissue cases. I mean, Wes, this course we took with Pat Allen, it wasn't really about this primarily. Right. But I, I took away from this course, I mean, so much. It's not hard to do this, Wes. No, it's not. In fact, I think that... We wanted to go learn from the best, and that's mm. why. Our review of this course is if you're placing uh, implants and you believe in what Tomas is saying as far as in zero bone loss concepts, one of the key determinants to bone loss is soft tissue thickness. One of the best ways that you can augment your patient's tish soft tissue is Alloderm. And um, donated human tissue um, is amazing. It does have some caveats to it. But for the most part, whenever you go take a course and you learn some of the techniques that he teaches there about grafting around teeth and implants, you're going to be able to come back, I feel like, John, and apply those principles that we learned in that course to really any implant surgery that requires this type of augmentation and you're going to do it. Here's what's great. Whenever somebody repeats what you, their findings, and it's backing up what you're hearing from another person's findings, one mm -hmm. of the things that Tomas talks about in here, he says, I found that there was an increase in this fibrous bound down tissue. And also I found that when we do these allodermis grafts, we get a deepening of the vestibular area. Mm. That was one of the advantages that Pat Allen spoke of that he didn't even anticipate yep. would happen doing this type of grafting and the techniques that you use when you do this, that you get a deepening of the vestibule and you get a really true, dense, bound down, functional tissue. Mm -hmm. and we'll not talk about the difference between functional tissue and non-functional tissue tonight because we want to concentrate on this book. But I will say is that... Um, this is more confirmation to me. You know, this is where it started for us. You know, John, like you said, you told it great. It was kind of a story from a standpoint of like we were challenged mm -hmm. by this because it one, it challenged our mind about what kind of implants we're using and what really matters. Yep. And we always kind of said really in the last years of this podcast, we said, you know, maybe connection does matter long term. Yeah. And I think now what we can say, John, is that soft tissue is king, mm -hmm. right? Hard tissue is is 
is is just as important. Right. But soft tissue is king, and it also determines what type of implant you should be looking at in these surgical sites. Yep, and when and, you should consider augmentation. And, and you know when the you other should consider augmentation. And the other thing I thought, you know, just to kind of finish out this chapter <clears throat> that was interesting is, you know, now the next question might come to your mind: Should we just augment every single site because right. it could get tempting? Well, he he addresses that. He knew that question would come up, yep. and he talks about how much is too much, and and his conclusion is, and he, and he supports this with some good data. He talks about that the. Uh, the average increase that he was seeing was that he would end up with tissue was that was between three and four millimeters, mm -hmm. and that that was comparable to the mucosa height of three point six millimeters, which uh, a, a famous study found uh, when they did soft tissue biopsies around healthy implants. Yeah, this is on so, page one fourteen. So yeah, check it out. It's great so he's stuff. saying you know that three to four millimeters makes sense. That's recreating the needed tissues mm -hmm. for bone maintenance. But what if you get more than that. What if you get five, six millimeters? Um, and he cites some studies that show that when you have these deeper pockets, you have the a uh, little bit higher risk for preimplantitis. You also potentially have uh, more of the anaerobic uh, pathogens down in those pockets or potential for that. So essentially he's saying five millimeters probably should be the limit that uh, mm -hmm. if you are trying to augment past that, you might be doing more harm than you are good. Um, this is mainly a technique that should be used in the thin tissue type. So it doesn't mean that surgeons, you need to be augmenting every case. Uh, it's not necessarily more is better. It's more is better up to what is normal, which is that three to four range. Past that, you're really not benefiting and you might actually be having a negative. So I like the fact that he pointed out kind of how much is too much and correlated that back to what these studies have shown that is most conducive to health. So, so basically you know, periodontal probing depths, he points us out mm -hmm. between five and seven with no bleeding on probing. Be careful when you're probing around your dental implants. I mean, some of you, you know, you, you look at page 115, it's perfect, man, because I, I talk about this stuff in classes. When you probe around a dental implant, a lot of times you're probing at a 45 degree angle. So yep. what's... You know, when you go into implant interface at a 45-degree angle, it's going to be longer, right? right, versus going from top to bottom. And so, really, the vertical measurement comes from looking at it from the side picture shot, like a lateral shot, holding your perio probe on the implant interface and looking at it from the height of the soft tissue, the, the dense bound down tissue, and you see three to four millimeters, that's ideal, yep. right? That's what he achieved through doing this thickening. If you get anything between five and seven, it's probably okay, but you're starting to push the limits of probably having some bacterial issues because implant sulcus or call, if you want to call it that, mm. right, is non-protective because the Sharpies fibers run in only one direction around a dental implant. Here we go yep. into the teaching mode. One direction in a circumferential way. How many ways do they run into a tooth? It's like it's like 11 or 12, John, right? Yep. It's like 11 or 12, and they embed into the side of the tooth and all this kind of stuff. So implant connections, right, or implant soft tissue, let's say it, right, is non-protective. So if it gets deeper, it could be a problem. And that's that's one of the things that I took home from this chapter. It was really, really good. Yeah. Because yeah. it can be too thick. Right. And so be careful. So you should be, if you look back at these last three chapters, um, which is basically all kind of fits together, different ways that we can increase soft tissue thickness uh, to to get better bone stability Again, I, I want to, to again make this more you know applicable. If you're a surgeon, you already know what you need to be doing, right? If you're mm. a surgeon, you need to be looking at this data. You need to be considering this. You need to be looking at the techniques, and you maybe need to go take a course on alloderm if you haven't. Uh, and you need to get better at this because it's going to make your outcomes better. It's going to make your restorative dentists happier because they're not going to see as much bone loss around their implants. Your patients are going to have better outcomes. Uh, if you're a restorative dentist, I think that's where this is challenging. I know we have a lot of restorative dentists listening to the show. And, um, you know, for many Which years, means, right. that was... Why is it challenging, John? Because, well, 
you're going to have to tell the surgeon what to do. Yeah. And that's, and that's embarrassing sometimes. It's daunting. You know? It's daunting. It's daunting. And so we just so. want you to, so that's one of the reasons why, here it is Christmas, right? Buy your surgeon this book. Say, Merry Christmas. Hands down, man. I bought you a book. And and we're not, Quintessence isn't paying us for that or anything. Like, we're not, we don't make a dime from that. But we, like, I bought one of my oral surgeon friends this book and said, hey, I want you to look at this. Let's sit down and talk through this book. Yeah, have because a cup of coffee. I think it'll make you better. It'll make me better. I think this is some modern ideas. It's all supported by data. And sit down and have that conversation. How can we deal with these? Because, hey, I'm maybe, you know, be humble about it, restorative dentists. You know, look at your cases. Go, hey, I'm seeing some bone loss around these. I don't really know. I didn't really understand why. Now, I think maybe I'm understanding why more. This is some new information. What do you think? And if you Mm -hmm. approach it that way, um, I think you can prepare because these are not difficult. These are not techniques that are going to take your surgeon a lot more time or a lot more cost. It's, it's just a mindset difference and make sure you have a conversation about your implant type you're using and Mm -hmm. when should different implant types be used? When should you consider flattening the ridge and using a polished collar? When should you consider driving the implant deeper? When should you consider augmenting the bone or I'm sorry, augmenting the soft tissue and should that be done simultaneous with uh, healing abutment being placed? Should that be done single stage, two stage? These are the discussions to have. And 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 I think you're going to find that you're, again, going to have less, much less of these situations. I used to complain about one of my surgeons who put implants in so deep. You know I'm talking about, Wes. And I'd be like, <laughs> Man, he, these you implants. See me pictures of these yeah. like bone channels. And I'm yeah, like, exactly. How we, how we, and I'm like, how oh, are we doing this? Man, I gotta, I gotta profile every case. Uh, I gotta, and you know, here's what happens. And here's what I'm gonna kind of rant against restorative dentists because I hear this stuff all the time, Wes. Restorative dentists saying, "Why are you put the implants in so deep?" You know, I, I can't get an impression coping on there. That I means I got to deal with the blood, and the patient here feels it every time I uh, remove. That's the right, it hurts, I mean, and I got to get it, it hurts. numb, and then it blanches, and and, and you know, then the lab. I just want to put the crown on. Can't you just right. do it? And Can't then you, you just do it. Yeah, just put it in a little shallower, you know, and right. and then the lab is trying to figure out how do I design yeah. my abutment? Do so I bl- how much tissue blanching because it is placed so deep? It is hard. They're not getting X rays, so. What I want you to understand, restorative dentists, restorative clinicians, is, you know what? If you do it this way, it's not easy. You're not no. making your restorative process easier. You are going to make it a bit harder. That's where platform shifting does help you because it's easier to get the components on and off when you're placing this into deeper tissues, when you're going more subcrestal, but you're not making it easier on yourself. So if you have a surgeon who believes in this, like the guy I used to maybe complain more about, he didn't necessarily know this. This is just what he was doing. He was placing implants more deeply. But now that I look back, I think, you know, some of those struggles that I had with restorative because they were placed more deeply, well, there's a reason why those have worked so well because it was placed according to these principles, whether we knew it or not at that time. Now we understand there's a reason for that. So, you're going to have to give your surgeon a little leeway here. If you're going to tell him to do this stuff, guess what? You're going to come back with some more yeah, challenging problems. restorative problems, and you're going to have to manage them. You're going to have to work your tissue more. You're going to have to do more provisionalization. You're going to have to do more customized healing abutments. Deal with it, guys. Deal with it. You're right, going to you know, need to other be thing that's, a doctor here. I think the other thing is we close out the show that's already came up on the socials since we started posting this stuff was... People are asking now, because of this book and what we've been talking about, they want to know what the actual internal connection of the stability of their particular implant they're using, the brands that are out there, what's the taper of my internal connection? Right. And brand specific. What are, what are they? Or is it a flat to flat? Is it an internal mm. connection? But what kind of taper does it have? Man. And one person requested a list. Comprehensive a, chart. A comprehensive chart. All the manufacturers. All, all the manufacturers. What type of connection they have. Whether it's suitable for sub, subcrestal, supercrestal placement. That's right. It fits because, right in with this book. Because it fits right in with this book. And that's what this book did. It made some shout-outs 
to certain manufacturers. And it also said, wait a minute, be careful what you do with certain manufacturers, but be careful right. what you do with and some. And he was careful not to call them out he by, by he name, He didn't throw per anybody under the bus. No, He no. didn't throw anybody under the bus. And I love that book, and I love Tomas for how he wrote this book. But what I'm saying here is, is stay tuned, mm-hmm. because some point in time, you will see us release something like that. We might, we might, I, we're going to. We're going to try. So we're we're going to try. Gonna try. To it's, a, it's a big task. It's a big task, but we're going to try, and there are people out there that might want to help us with that, but we will uh, we will do that, and um, so hold us to that. If you want that, send us a message. Some of you have already sent us those messages, but send us some more. Yeah. So listen, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, this is, this is the Dental Guys book club, right? Right? This is yeah. good stuff, and we, we've been wanting to do this for a while, and I'm excited about more in the future. I'm also excited about, you know, what's coming up next year, John. Mm-hmm. We have some special interviews coming up. You all know that we have formed a relationship with the Academy of Osseo Integration next year. Uh, we are doing some quarterly podcasting with them, but in a bigger way, we're covering the 2020 meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, we pinch yourself again. Every time I sink it, I can't believe it. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a booth on the main show floor. We're going to be doing some live interviews there, live streaming. We're going to be some doing some man on the street. It's going to be amazing. Believe it or not, we're going to be speaking at the L- Young Clinicians Luncheon. You've seen it in your program if you don't have it already on Friday. And then also, we are going to be interviewing um, the president of the Academy of Osseo Integration. Mm. We are yeah, in Jay talks with... Yes, we're super excited about having Dr. Monquest on the show and um, stay tuned for that in the coming month. Um, it's going to be a great year for the Dental Guys and the Dental Guys podcast. We're excited for you guys. So um, listen, again, I hope everyone has a great Christmas time. Enjoy your family. And uh, this has been another great episode, John. And if you're listening to this and you haven't uh, given us a five-star review, go, go over there and give us a five-star review on iTunes. It's how people find out about us if mm-hmm. you share about what's your experience with the dental guys, maybe something you've learned it helps us to keep going. Send us a shout out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the stuff. Subscribe, like, and share. And don't forget, we have a YouTube channel where you can watch us, uh, our emotions, and uh, watch our body language as we talk about these things. It's kind of fun. We have a lot of YouTube subscribers, and yep. uh, I think we're approaching over a thousand or so subscribers now. A lot of a lot of people tuning in us there, so feel free to tune in us to on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, that's the Dental Guys. We're at thedentalguys.net. Uh, stay tuned for more episodes as we continue to cover zero bone loss content con- concepts. Well, for John, I'm Wes, and this has been another great episode. And we are the Dental Guys. Yeah.